This slide is uh, perhaps the most important slide of the talk. So it's about, um, it explains what is landscape experiment. So, um, um, so we have a population of imply uh, bacteria and uh, in, a, in, a, in a glucose medium. And they reproduce asexually. Okay, so they don't need to find the mates. Okay, they can reproduce by themselves. And uh, so the most important thing is the daily cycle in um, landscape experiment. So we have to understand what happens in one day, then we know we know what happens in every day. So in one day, we start with a certain amount of uh, E. coli, and they reproduce asexually until um, um, there's no glucose. Okay? And they start a period of starvation. Well, this period is not important because we assume that uh, the E. coli stay unchanged. Okay? So we, we don't care about this moment. Okay? So we, we only need to, uh, to ensure that at, at the next step in time, uh, they have uh, consumed all the glucose. Okay? So the next day, or the end of the day, or the, the start, start the morning of the next day, they sample a certain proportion of uh, E. coli and then put it in a fresh new uh, glucose medium. And then it starts the same day, okay? Every day, uh, um, um, do the same thing uh, in the same way. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 yes, okay, so the, the important thing, is, so it's, it's explained in this, uh, in this graph, right? So this is the beginning of uh, the day. We have a small amount of E. coli in a uh, glucose medium, right? So yes, there's a lot of glucose here. And uh, at the end of the day, so the glucose has been used up, and the, the, glucose, uh, the E. coli has increased, right? the correlation has increased. And we sample, uh, well, no 100, right? From, well, you can define it, okay? So in their experiment, it is 100, right? So you can define it, uh, whatever you want. And you sample this amount of uh, E. coli and put it in a new glucose medium and then start the next day. Okay, um. Okay, nice work. Um, yes, um, so it's uh, been going on since 1988. And uh, the, the population has evolved, in, which means that uh, uh, they, uh, the, the individuals they have uh, mutations already, uh, new mutations, right, accumulated a long time, um, and they are adapted to the glucose environment. Adapted means they are fitter to the environment, so right, they are fitter to the environment, and. Uh, the interesting thing is that the samples of the population have been stored at regular intervals, so you can consider them as fossils, right? As, as, as the fossils. Uh, the difference is that you, you have to look for fossils in the nature, but uh, here it's in laboratory, right? You made it, right? You made it uh, by yourself. And we can com compare the different samples and then to see uh, the difference between um, samples from different times, right? So we can see the uh, evolutionary change, right? Uh, are there any questions? Well, okay, so one. Um, the researchers, they are interested in, in uh, relative fitness over time, right? So, um, as we already said, that uh, they, um, they are adapted to the environment, so uh, we can, um, it's not surprising that the relative fitness will increase over time, right? So there was this uh, sketch plot, and uh, they want to find the curves which fit these uh, this, uh, points, 
One is a hyperbolic model and one is a power law model. This is a power law model. And the hyperbolic model has, well, uh, for this one, it has unbounded limit, right? Increased to the infinity. For the hyperbolic, it has bounded uh, limit. And uh, uh, so they are, um, they don't know which model to, to choose. How they calculate fitness? Ah, okay, uh, I'll come back to that. How they calculate it? Uh, okay, it's here. Sorry, I didn't uh, explain this. Sorry. Oh, okay, I skipped the one slide, right? Or I skipped this one. I skipped this one. Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, so how to define relative fitness of two strings? Um, consider two populations. One is uh, on evolved strain, so the population at the very beginning in 1988. Okay, I take um, a population of size A A naught, and another one is a, a evolved strain. I take a population size B naught, and I put them together in the same uh, glucose medium, and let them evolve, right? And then A naught becomes A one, B naught becomes B one, right? And what I do is um, B1 divided by B0, I take the log and divided by log A1 over A0, right? So if you uh, consider that the, the individuals they increase exponentially, so this is the reproduction rate of the evolved uh, string, right? This is the reproduction rate of the unevolved uh, string, and the, this is the ratio between their reproduction rates. Okay, that's the relative fitness. Um, does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So. Yeah, so they uh, propose two models. Uh, one is uh, uh, this power model, the parabola, the, the, another is a hyperbolic model, which has a and uh, other bound uh, for this one, WT it has on the uh, has the, has the this time in days or in what the you say uh, generations. generations. So one day is one generation. But in one day there are quite a few cell divisions, maybe ten. There are few. You, if if at the start of the day there were say one million uh, cells, and at, at the end of the day it was. 100 million, then there, are, there were quite a few divisions because each division makes twice more. Uh, if you had million after one division, it will be two millions. Um, so it's, if one division is generation, then it is not one day. Um, yes, I think you're right. Uh, I, I don't recall um, the definition of generation very clearly. Um, um, so you, okay, it's, it's days, let's say days, yeah? Yeah, for me they are not too different. 50,000 <laughs> days, how many years? It's close up to 15,000. Uh, so 300 is one year, 3,000, 10, days, um, 10. Say, so. So maybe... <laughs> Thirty. No, it uh, is. I think it's generation. Probably it's not days. Not days. <laughs> Fifty thousand. I think it's more than uh, okay. at least more than century. Century. It's around thirty thousand days. Okay. Am I right. So three hundred sixty-one year. Three thousand six hundred is ten, and thirty-six thousand. It's hundred years. It's one. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, probably this is number of divisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real generation. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, we want to understand why um, the increase of the relative phase is slow and slower. Well, it's natural, right? So, on one point, it's not surprising. Um, it's increased because the individuals are fitter and fitter. 
right? Uh, more, they are more and uh, more and more adapted to the, to the environment, and uh, it gets slower and slower. Okay. Um, well, they they stay in a you know, in a limited environment, right? It's it's natural to think that uh, the increase um, will get slower and slower, despite the number of fixed mutations increase almost linearly. Uh, I didn't show the figure, but uh, trust me, so the um, the accumulation of uh, mutations is almost linear. Um, we want to. Um, um, to give um, a simple model to explain this, to explain this uh, curve, and it's passionate to find out is it possible to uh, uh, create a simple model which gives a curve like that. Um, there are many um, explanations for the for this uh, phenomenon. Uh, Kronor interference, which means as an Different mutants, they can interact with each other, and uh, um, the competition, the competition um, um, may slow down um, the evolution of the, of the population. Okay, or it can be epistasis, which means uh, the performance of a mutant will depend on the background, on the genetic background. Okay. It depends on who you are with. Okay. Um, and the last thing is the design of the current experiment, the daily cycles, the limited supply of resources, sampling procedure, etc. So um, we are trying to understand if we can use the design of an experiment to have a curve like that. Okay. Um, well, um, in large part of, of the literature, corona interference and epistasis uh, are considered um, to play a big role in, um, in this kind of phenomenon. But uh, this study is um, just to use, to focus on the design of experiment, experiment to, you know, a starting point uh, to study the landscape experiment. So next, I will uh, talk about the individual-based modeling. So we are trying to understand the shape of the relative fitness curve, right? So you remember the parabola. Um, which mechanisms are involved? And uh, <coughs> we are going to define an individual-based model, which is a microscopic, for the evolution of a bacterial population, and a study of macroscopic rate of fitness of the population over time. And in fact, this is um, a major thing in probability theory um, to study the macroscopic phenomenon um, by using a microscopic, microscopic model. So it's somehow the, the central um, topic in uh, probability theory. For example, if we want to understand why water becomes ice at uh, temperature zero. This is the macroscopic phenomenon, right? And the uh, biologist, sorry, uh, probabilist, they will uh, establish a, a, a random model. So they have, uh, so we assume many individuals, particles, and we define the rules how they interact with each other. And we prove some limit theorems and the limit theorem is uh, so under some scaling, under you know the, the, the size of a particle go to infinity, etc. Right? And uh, uh, and this the the model in the, the, the object in the limit will have some phase transition phenomenon. So like the ice, the, the water becomes ice at uh, exactly at temperature zero. Okay, so this is a phase transition phenomenon. And uh, um, so we like, so probabilists like to use the, the microscopic, microscopic, microscopic sorry, model to understand the uh, microscopic phenomenon. And uh, that's uh, somehow exactly the same we are going to do in this model. And uh, we are sure that in the limit of large populations, on the suitable time scale and for a suitable choice of the parameters, the relative fitness process converges to a deterministic function, a function like Z1. Okay.
Okay, so uh, there are still some uh, um, something to, uh, to say about the experiment. So we assume that every individual has a reproduction rate. Okay, so the individual um, will split okay, or reproduce at the reproduction rate. It's a random phenomenon. Okay, it's a random phenomenon. It's after uh, after an exponential time, it will split. Okay. And uh, a mutation only changes the reproduction rate. And all the mutations considered are beneficial. Okay, so a type of sorry, beneficial. Um, why beneficial? Because uh, no beneficial mutations they were um, they are negligible. They are um, they cannot compete with the beneficial ones. And of course, it's also a, um, a simplification of. Uh, uh, of the model. And there are two parts in the experiment. The, um, the continuous growth of the population within one day, and also the discrete sampling between days. Okay? In one day, it increased continuously. And between days, the, uh, the sampling are discrete. Right? And at the beginning of each day, we assume there are n interviews. And uh, within each day, English will produce by binary splitting at a, rate, a constant rate R positive. So R is the reproduction rate. Okay, it's a random thing, right? It's a random thing. And the reproduction process will stop when the glucose has been consumed, which happens when there are uh, gamma times n in English, right? In the landscape experiment, gamma is one unit. And uh, n individuals out of the gamma n are sampled uniformly without replacement to form the initial population at the next day. Right? So that's what uh, uh, we have uh, seen um, at the beginning. Okay, so let's see some uh, um, graphs. So at the beginning, we have uh, five individuals. So that, let's see uh, what happens in, uh, in one day. So they increase, it continues to increase, right? So by binary splitting, binary splitting, it's increased, right? And then we reach the end of the day. There are a lot of, there are uh, much more um, images at the end of the day. Then what we do is a sample, the same amount of uh, images from the end of the day, five. Right? We sample five from this um, from this pool of individuals, and uh, uh, we don't know who will be selected. Okay? We don't know the types of the individuals. It's random, and we let it evolve again, and uh, and we repeat it, repeat it since 1988. Um, we make some assumptions. We assume that the beneficial mutations they add the real n to the reproduction rate of individual that suffers mutation. Okay. So when a mutation arrives, we assume that it adds real n to the reproduction of the reproduction rate of the individual that suffers the mutation. Uh, so this is a select. Uh, this is a um, 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 the, the benefit that the mutation brings to the individual. And uh, the next is the probability that the, the mutation happens. And uh, the probability is, uh, we call it mu n. Okay. Every individual um, will have a, uh, will uh, have a beneficial mutation with probability mu n. And uh, this mutation affects only one. Okay, so everyone has his own mutation. Okay, it affects his, his own, uh, affects his own. And uh, every uh, offspring of this menu will carry this mutation. Okay, so it will either spread, the mutation will either spread, or it will vanish, disappear. Right? If this mutation 
um, um, deficit the population, which means in the end, everyone will carry the same mutation. Then it's code fixation, right? I, I completely invade the population, right? So it means that the offspring of this particular individual completely occupy the population. This is called a fixation. And then we assume that the uh, mu n is much less than rho, and this will include, will exclude the chrono interference, which means um, we will, not, for most of the times, we will not see two different mutants uh, coexist. Okay. What we will see in the limit is that um, we'll, um, the, the muta mu mu uh, mutation will either fixate or disappear, right? And uh, only after this period, the next mutation will, will arrive. So we um, intentionally um, assume this to, to only allow one type of multi mutant exist. Okay? We don't see two mutants, two types of the mutants coexist. We don't allow that. Okay. Well, of course, it's a simplification. So this, is, this means that you have homogeneous population when the new introduced mutation and wait when it becomes homogeneous again. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Homogeneous in the sense that uh, you only have two types, in fact. One is called the wild type, which is, uh, another is called the, mu the mutated type. Okay? Wild type and the mutated type. Wild, so mutated type is one mutation occurred to one wild type. So the, the question is, you don't introduce any more mutations up to the, so you wait when it becomes homogeneous, then you introduce the next mutation. Yes, exactly, yes. Um, but I don't do it artificially, okay? I prove it in a limit. Okay, I, I, I give some conditions, and I prove that um, we don't have two or more mutants coexist. Um, yeah, so... No, I, I'm thinking about this. You, you were introducing this individual-based model. So in this model, you somehow introduce mutations, you say, with some probability, probably, you say, randomly, some mutations take place, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is it correct? So in, in the, you have just described this. You even shown this uh, trees for individual-based model. Um, Did I get it? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, but this would mean if we have this limit, this means we introduce mutation and wait when they all become the same, and then introduce next mutation. Um, we don't do it artificially. So, they have the right to uh, produce uh, to have uh, two types of mutant um, at some time. It's okay. Uh, prob the probabilistically, it is fine. What we, um, what the, co the condition that we impose here will show that, will prove that in the limit, this thing does not happen. It happens with pre zero. Okay, so it's for analytics, for analytical model, not for individual based model. I think what you're saying is in the individual based model, yeah. you can have more than one mutation at any time. However, as time evolves, one of those mutations will disappear and one will dominate. Is that what you okay, so. So, yes. so when um, a new mutation appears, um, it will either vanish, okay, it increases a bit, then it's down. Uh, then another mutation appears, or it uh, gets down, or another, so this, this is a zero and one, okay, the proportion of the mutant population, or this one is uh, successful, it's the richest one, okay, it's the richest one. Um, so, 
what I uh, um, so th this is what happens in the limit. In the limit, it happens that um, one mutation it either vanishes or uh, it goes to um, um, goes to one you know, to fix it the population. Um, and uh, the net mutation only arrives when uh, after you either fix uh, vanish or you uh, fix the population. Okay, they do not interfere. Okay. That's what happens in the limit, but uh, when it's not in the limit, you can have two or more mutations coexist for a certain time. Okay, you can. And we can say random, right? There's a probability not zero. That's what we prove in the limit. So that's it's very technical. It's the, the main the main mathematical contribution to that. Okay, so Fi is a relative fitness, and it depends on the reproduction rates of the of the individuals in the population, and it depends on the amount of growth cost you give to the two competing populations, right? And um, so here comes the theorem, the first result. So let R not be the reproduction rate at the beginning of day not day zero. And then let fi the process of relativeness. So this fi is a random process. Okay, it's a random process. And on the assumption a, the sequence f. Okay, this is a scale. So we do a time scale. Okay, we do a time scale. For a fixed t, so this number is large. It goes to infinity when n um, goes to infinity. Okay. It's very dark. And this process is converged in distribution locally uniformly to the deterministic function, this. Yeah? Why does your gamma not depend on fitness itself? Because based on the definition of fitness you gave at the start, it seems like at the end of the day you're getting more bacteria, so therefore gamma should get higher as species get um, Now the, 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 the amount of glucose you give them is fixed. It yes, is fixed. but the population at the end isn't. Um, so we somehow also do um, a simplification. So you have fixed initial population size. Uh, initial population size, right? And you have the fixed um, amount of uh, of glucose, and then we deduce that you have a fixed um, uh, uh, fixed size at the end. Okay, this is a simplification. Okay. Because the amount of glucose uh, you give them is fixed, and the initial population is fixed. Whatever their reproduction is, the rate is, the, the, the end, at the end, we always get the same, right? But we, we assume that the, their biological activity do not consume the glucose. The glucose only, is only used to help them to reproduce. It's a simplification. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, it just feels like that doesn't match up with your fitness definition of, um, of, of the right of fitness at the very start, the log uh, B, A to B not divided by log A, 1 over A not, because presumably if you've got the same population size at the start and end each time, your fitness is never increasing. Um. Um, the the, the relative fitness in our model, so we define it somehow uh, differently. Um, we def so in in okay, so F uh, is defined as um, T uh, R I Q uh, 
Okay, so let's say it's R I. In R, uh, in R, not new times N. Okay, I found N. So R I is the reproduction rate of individual I in the evolved population. And R0 is the reproduction rate of the unevolved population. Okay? And there are n of them. And for this one, uh, okay, I is from 1 to n, and U is fixed. Um, this is my definition of uh, uh, relative fitness in this model. It's a little bit different from uh, what the Bart says uh, in their papers. Okay, so I, I agree there's some difference. But what I can do is that in the limit, they are do agree. Okay. Okay, so the yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'll avoid uh, using too much of the blackboard. Um, yes, but uh, this is not quite the parabola we have seen before, right? The, the power here is one half, but uh, before it's different. Um, to create uh, the, um, this curve, WT, we include the epistasis. How much time do I have? Very good. Okay. Um, so we uh, in, in introduce epistasis. Epistasis, epistasis means that the, the performance of the mutant will depend on the genetic background, on, depend on where you are, right? So where we are is, we assume the relative, relative fitness is x, okay? So the population relative fitness is x. And when the, in this case, when a uh, mutation arrives, then it gives the beneficial, um, it gives the increment to the reproduction rate, rho n x. This time it depends on x. x is a genetic background, right? And we give this form. Well, of course, it's just for mathematical inconvenience, right? I don't know what you write, what happens. And in this case, we can uh, prove that uh, in the limit, we have this curve right? as, a, as a limit. Well, uh, I'm not going to uh, give the um, proof that's too technical. Uh, so next, uh, I want to talk about the continuum modeling. So what's the motivation? So features of the individual basic model is um, at most of one half mutants exist with wild type. Okay, so that's uh, what we have explained in the blackboard. And the reproduction rate is unbounded in the long term. So that corresponds to the, uh, the power law model. Um, and the, the script generation becomes continuous time. Okay, it becomes continuous time because after time scaling, uh, you have the discrete generations, the generations, and after time scaling, you get um, continuous time. It's a mathematical thing, right? It's not. Um, it's a bit far from the reality. So what I want to do is I want I want to allow different types of mutants to coexist, and uh, the reproduction rate is bounded. Okay, it's like the hyperbolic model proposed in uh, in the biologist paper, and uh, we also um, assume that uh, we also I also want. Um, the discrete generations remain discrete, okay, as stay discrete. And uh, to that purpose, I assume that uh, we have an uh, infinite population size and the, the generation that is discrete. Um, the reproduction rate of an individual is a value in zero. Okay, it can be in any uh, finite interval, but to do that for convenience, uh, I fix it as, as a zero one. And the individuals at any generation mutate 
independently with parameter b. Okay, this parameter b is same for all the interviews. They mutate independently. Okay, and uh, after mutation, the mutant will obtain a new pro uh, reproduction rate sampled from the same mutant distribution. So what does what does it mean? Uh, the mutation is random, right? When the mutation arrives to an individual, you don't know the outcomes, right? You don't know outcomes. So you don't know whether it's bad or good, or, right? So then we assume it's, it's random, okay? We assume the mutant has a random reproduction rate, and uh, how to determine this value, we give it a law, and this law is the same for all the mutants. Okay, I hope it makes sense. Now it comes um, um, the continu continu continuum model. Um, so it's basically a dynam dynamic system. So Pn is the distribution of the reproduction rate at generation n. Okay, so the distribution of the reproduction rate at generation n, and the Pn plus 1 is a distribution of the reproduction rate at generation 1 plus n. And uh, this dynamic system tells you how to update um, from Pn to Pn plus 1. So how do we update this? As we know that uh, um, um, any individual will mutate with project B, right? Since we have an infinite size of population, it means a proportion B of the population will be mutated. And once it's mutated, it will get a new value sampled from the same distribution, Q. The Q is the uh, uh, mutant distribution. Okay? It is the same for all the interviews. So once it's uh, mutated, um, it follows the Q distribution. So, it's a, so we have seen the term B times Q. Right. Uh, for those uh, that uh, didn't mutate, they will um, go through the selection part, which means they will um, go to the competition part. Uh, what, what is DX? Uh, okay. So P and DX means um, the proportion. Um, of the population which has uh, fitness, or, or sorry, uh, has a reproduction rate x. Okay, so uh, it's fractional population yeah, yes, with, yes. with x. Yes, p and dx is the proportion of the population which has this, uh, reproduction rate x. Okay, and uh, it's um, so we have a selection there for for those that didn't make it. Again, p is fraction. P is a priority measure. Uh, also, we call it distribution. I still don't understand what is dx. So x is the production rate. What is dx? Uh, dx is like a calculus, you know, dx, fx, dx. So, so this p should be, say, fraction of of cells with x from x to x plus dx. That's right. This right, yes. Okay. Yes. A bit, a bit confusing, so I don't see. So I would put it like p as a function of x rather than a function of dx. Am I right? I'm not sure. Uh, if you have density, you can write like uh, fx. So it's like dx. probability yeah. density function. Uh, Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. P yeah. And, yeah. If P and has density F, yeah. then it, you can write it as Fx times dx. Yeah, but this. So, it, so if you would say P is a function of x and Q is a function of x, it would be somehow more or less clear. Uh, uh, it's a probability measure or a distribution. So if it has density, you can use the density function. Uh, to interpret it. And then your reproduction rate is 
bounded by one, yeah? Yes, yes. On the other hand, you say that your reproduction rate in long run can grow infinitely. It's what oh, you well, say. Oh, well, yeah, that's, uh, so, you know, the biologists, they propose two models. One is hyperbolic, one is uh, um, power law. Power law is the infinity. It goes to infinity. And hyperbolic is, is bounded. So, 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 yes. so this one is corresponds to their hyperbolic model. They have the bounded the reproduction rate in the long term. Okay, yeah. Yes. And uh, so, <coughs> x is a reproduction rate, and uh, we let the population evolve for time tn. And uh, since it's a reproduction rate, so it's about times te to the power tn times x, right? And uh, it's divided by gamma. So divided by gamma is uh, the sampling, right? We sample from the evolved. Uh, population one over gamma, right? And it, it becomes um, a probability measure again, right? Uh, we understand this part, right? So why I impose this thing, right? It's a response to a landscape experiment. I let it evolve um, the gamma times the initial size, and then I send one over gamma fraction from the at the end of the day, right? So. We are interested uh, whether this um, um, model converts, and, uh, and the answer is that uh, yes. So landscape experiment has a unique and net distribution, which may or may not have condensation on the maximum reproduction rate, depending on the parameters. So here we have a phase transition impact. So. We may have a condensation phenomenon happen in the limit, which means if I don't have a mass at the maximum uh, maximum um, reproduction rate, the limit may have the mass there. Okay, I have a, I maybe have a, some mass will travel to the maximum reproduction rate in the limit, but uh, when the time is finite, you don't have mass there. So it's a um, it's a phase transition depending on, on B. Okay, you move B, you, you, you let B bigger or smaller, this phenomenon will happen or not happen. And this model, uh, this model is an extension of uh, uh, Sir John Frank Charles Kingman. He is a very famous British mathematician. Um, what, uh, this model is like this. Okay, he proposed it in 1978. Um, the only difference is the selection. Okay, so uh, in, in the last model, we have a, a very clear definition. That you, you see a gamma, right? So you know what it means. And uh, this the selection, um, uh, it's not very clear, right? So why we write this way? But it's very simple form, and it's mathematically very nice. Very nice. And I came to that it has a unique length distribution which may or may not depend, uh, have condensation depending on the parameters. And I uh, extended it by uh, making the B, the vacation properties, random. And uh, what I impose, uh, I assume that I replace them by the, an RID sequence of uh, random variables, beta m. OK, so every generation, the, for, gen uh, the, for, uh, for, gen uh, for different generations, they have different mutation probabilities, right? Before, it's B all, all the time, right? It's B all the time. Now, I make it random. I make it a little bit complicated, right? So it's co kind of a uh, uh, thing mass model in a random environment, right? The environment uh, makes the reproduction probabilities random. So, um, the, their question, does the PN converge? Yes. If so, when the cover, when the condensation occurs, well, I have uh, some criteria for, for that. It's already complicated. What is the con uh, con convergence speed? Um, so how fast it goes to the converge to the limit, right? You can compute the moment of the, of the, uh, uh, the distribution PN. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we have some result for that. And the last question, so if we assume that the beta n 
because they are RID, right? So beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, actually they have the same distribution, so they have the same mean, right? Assume that this RID sequence has the same mean B, uh, is a limit filter in the random model, then in the human model, all the way around. Um, filter means you put more mass on the bigger values of x. Okay, so your mass moves more to the right, towards f, towards the right, right? So that means filter. So do you have an intuition for that one? What do you think? If I make the things random, make the material already random, do you think the limit will become fitter or less fitter? So what I proved is that if we make the uh, the um, rate is random, the limit will be less fitter. Okay, despite that they have the same mean, right? So the mean. So somehow you um, uh, put a bit, the reproduction bit, a uh, reproduction uh, probability. Sorry, the mutation probability a little bit, right? You add some noise to the mutation probability. The consequence is that the limit will be less fitter, which means it will put more mass on the smaller values of x. So in King's, Kingsman model, it will be lower fitter, fitting compared to this, when you have random beta. Is no, 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 the random version will, lower, will be lower. Uh -huh. Okay, so, yeah. So that's um, a discovery that I found it interesting. Okay, maybe I should stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions? I have a question. Yes. Yeah. I don't really understand the maths towards the end, I've got to be honest. But when you do the random thing, I was thinking it should be fitter because that's how like, nature works. Things happen randomly <laughs> and evolution happens. So intuitively, I would have said that would make for a fitter population just based on common. Yeah, happiness. yeah. Well, I, so have you got any comments about the relationship between kind of random mutations in nature and the results of this experiment, this numerical experiment? Uh, well, what you experiment? You mean the Latin experiment? Or? Yeah, so you're saying you've made this B thing random rather than always the same. Uh -huh. So you've added noise to the system. Yes. And uh -huh. that's, made it, that, that's made the whole kind of E. coli population less fit. Uh, well, they didn't do this experiment, in fact. They didn't do this in the This is this my, my question. On, on this mathematical model. So is that not what, like, is the experiment in the dish, Petri dish, not based on random? Well, you know, on the last experiment, you, you never know about the reality. You cannot uh, make uh, an experiment based on fixed mathematical probability and another one on random mathematical probability. Because you, the reality is, is there, so, so the real thing is there, right? So, you, you never know if it is random or deterministic. It's just there. Only the difference is in your models. Um, so this question is somehow unrelated to, to the landscape experiment, work, but I find this interesting, okay? Um, in the mathematical point of view and also in, in the intuition point of view, right? So, so I ask this question to many people. And someone ask, uh, say it's better or someone says that's better. So, you know, it makes the mathematical problem interesting. <laughs> so this one is not too much related to the experiment. In fact, yes. Well, mutations by definition are random. Sure. Uh, so no, no. So there are two randomness. Okay. First, individuals they mutate randomly. Yeah. But maybe according to a fixed uh, mutation already B. Right. 
But uh, now I add another layer of randomness to B. B is random. So this is a ran so it's kind of a random environment. So different N have different environments. Okay? So in some bad environments, the B may be uh, bigger. In some good environments, the B may be larger. So there are some noise in added to B. In the amount of glucose, for example, sometimes more glucose, sometimes less glucose, this would be random B, yeah. maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah, or not? So you say it's randomness in the environment? Yes. So the noise the is. The amount random. of glucose you put, it's, it's changing the changing environment. Yeah? Yes. Um, well, you, you can. Uh, Theoretically, how you uh, should be okay or not okay, but uh, you never know what the reality, right? Uh, I mean, it's lab in the laboratory. Uh, you never know it's random environment, or maybe it's random environment, but it does not change the proper pattern of the So we, we don't know. It's just a mathematical thing. So another point is this fitness can't go to infinity, obviously. So you put this. Power law. Um, it can go to infinity. I mean, if you let it evolve, uh, no, it's something I mean, wrong, and uh, the ratio will go to infinity. When cells proliferate, what they do? They take energy from glucose and transfer it into mass, mass of cells. Yeah. So this even so, you, you can find limit for fitness because it will be given by total sugar you put it there. So if you put a certain amount of sugar, you can calculate, for example, up to what extra biomass it will convert. And therefore, fitness is bounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's these <coughs> physical and chemical yeah. boundaries to what we can get out of some glucose. Um, uh, so it should converge. Eventually, fitness should converge to some. To some. So if the fit, so if it's the fit, the volume rate goes to infinity, it means uh, it takes the, 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 the time of co-evolution of unevolved and evolved strains will go to zero, right? So it takes less and less time to consume this. Uh, common glucose if you put them together, right? Do you think this can happen? I mean, so the N is large and generation is large and uh, one is so evolved, one is uh, unevolved, you put them together and uh, they consume the, the glucose so fast that the time needed is going to zero. But you take samples <laughs> always at certain time, therefore doesn't matter if they consume glucose too fast, it will be still same biomass at, at the time you take your sample. Well, it doesn't matter, maybe it's not so important. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, uh, more questions? Okay, thanks, Nipong. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for attending.